Christianity is a responsibility. It's not just I, I am born again. I'm enjoying the word of God. The rhema is sweet. You must have something you are doing because Jesus has asked us to go and make disciples of every nation. And if a believer is not doing it, then I want to ask the believer, why are you not making disciples? How many people in your local church are committed on the account of you? How many brethren have you deliberately and intentionally gotten close to you and influenced them to commitment, to productivity, to dedication, to making disciples? How many? None. You are just having a nice time. Enjoying Christ. Enjoying Rema. The essence for teaching is so that you can teach others. The essence for spiritual growth is so that you can help others to grow. You know, um, you won't listen to a pastor pastoring you and you're not pastoring someone else. There are some things, you know, I'm the only one that can tell you. Brother Paul says, the things you have heard of me are among many witnesses, the same. Commit to others. Commit to faithful men who will in turn commit the same to others. So brother Paul was telling them how he has fed them, how he has raised them, how he has equipped them, and how he has pastored them. And of course he was warning them to be careful so that nobody ridicules his labor of love over them. Anyone who ridicules the labor of his pastor over him cannot make progress in ministry. Let me announce again. Anyone who makes ridicule of the labor of his pastor over him cannot make progress in ministry. You know, you must come to a point in your life where you learn as a person of value never to speak down on people's kindness and labors. You must be a man and a woman who is grateful. You must be a person of gratitude. You must be a person full of thanksgiving. You know, um, sometimes you hear people say, well, eh, that kindness you showed me, anybody else could have done it. Why didn't anybody else do it? Why didn't anybody else do it? Anybody could have taught me the Bible. You're not the only one that can teach. Really. People get to that place. People get to that place. We live in an age where so many people have no values. Anything goes. Unthankful, unholy, ungrateful. We live in that age. Where you're such a blessing to people and they turn back and say, God could have used anybody else. Why didn't God use anybody else? Somebody blessed you with money. You say, thank you. Is only this one. An ungrateful generation of people. So brother Paul says, take heed to yourself. Take heed to the flock. You know, the opposite of taking heed is to be careless. Take heed means be careful. The Greek word prosecho, P-R-O-S-E-C-H-O. Prosecho has to do with being aware. Take heed. Procedure. God wants us who disciple his flock to be very much aware, to be conscious, not to slip off, not to doze over the flock. Every one of you that has a disciple, you have somebody you are teaching, you have somebody you are raising, you must take it to yourself and take it to the person. Watch over the flock. Those of us who are campus coordinators, those of us who are involved in discipleship in the campuses, in the headquarters here, you must take heed to yourself and take heed to the flock. Be careful for yourself and don't just be preoccupied with yourself. Watch over the flock. Brother Paul was saying, watch over the flock. If you look at that word, procedure, you will see it used in Matthew 6, 1, where Jesus says, beware of your attitude. Beware of your attitude. When you discover you are becoming lousy, you are talking carelessly, be careful. Take heed to yourself. When you find out that you are becoming comfortable without caution, prayer meeting, you miss it without feeling bad. Bible study, you stay away without feeling bad. Take it to yourself. Take it to yourself. Because in taking it to yourself, it will be easy for you to take it over the flock. You are not living for yourself. Because you have started teaching the word to people, people look up to you. You are an example. Don't be a bad example.
take heed to yourself. Be careful. Beware of yourself. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 15, Jesus asks us to beware of false prophets. Take heed. Beware of false prophets. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 17, Jesus also repeats, beware. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 6, Matthew chapter 16 verse 6, verse 11 and verse 12, Jesus said to them, beware of the living of the Pharisees. In other words, beware of false doctrine. Beware of your attitude. Beware of false doctrine. Beware of false prophets. Beware of false teaching. Beware of false prophets. Beware of false teachers. Look at Luke 21, 34. Luke 21, verse 34. <clears throat> and take it to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. Take it to yourself. Lest the things of this life overwhelm you. Suddenly your mood changes. Suddenly you get pressured. You get bothered. You become worried. You start forgetting the joy of salvation. You start carrying pressure. Every time you are not grateful. Because God should have done 20 things. He has only done one in the space of 3 years. And you are not grateful. In your eyes God has not tried. Because you are preoccupied with what you could do. Forgetting what he has done. You've got to take heed to yourself. Sometimes you see brethren and believers. You wonder if they are born again or not. They get so pressured with life. The joy of salvation no more radiating. And when joy leaves, strength leaves. So a lot of believers have no strength. They are weak all the time. They are tired all the time. No joy. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the enemy's strategy to sap you of strength. So he renders you immobile. Is to take away your joy. By bringing pressures. Anxiety. Worries. The cares of this life. And he calls it the deceitfulness of riches. Deceitfulness of riches. And the enemy will throw all of that at us. You start saying things you should not say. You start listening to wrong counsel. You begin to think of how to reduce your commitment in church. You start thinking of how to be less effective in church. You start saying, I belong to two departments. Maybe I should reduce it to one. In fact, let me stay for some time. And you start withdrawing. You start taking off from your commitment, your focus, the assignment, the responsibility that is upon all of us. Souls are dying. Souls are perishing. False teachers are working so hard day and night to see as many as they can lure from the truth. They are so occupied with deception. And you have the truth. But you're occupied with the chaos of this life. And in the battle for souls, you're losing. You're losing to false teachers. You're losing to false preachers. Because you have decided to preoccupy yourself with the chaos of this world. The battle is not for money. The battle is not for position. The battle is not for relevance. The battle is for souls. The devil is walking round the clock. He wants to kill people fast so they go without receiving Christ. He wants to delete people fast so they go without receiving Christ. The devil walks round the clock. Believers must walk round the clock in saving men, pulling them out of darkness to light. I had the story of some Chinese people that were in a sheep. I may not remember the details of that story, but something stood out in that story for me. True story. About 18 of them, they have met Christ. They know Christ. They were in this big ship with hundreds of people. And the ship wrecked in the sea. And the Chinese guy said, we have Christ, but these people don't have Christ. If these whole people die, they will go to hell. We have life jackets. Let's give out our life jackets. We die now, we know where we're going. They don't know where they're going. So they took off their life jackets. And put them on 18 people. And try to get some life jackets across to other people. And try to save as many as they could save. Because they said these people may not meet Christ if they die. We have Christ. We can go now. And the 18 of them perished in that, issue, in that wreck. And gave life to the rest. 
and prayed for the rest to meet Christ. Look at the level at which people are so passionate about helping people to see Jesus. Helping people to receive Christ. I read that story, it moved my entire being. That somebody will see death and opt for death rather than life so that other people have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Every day people pass by you, you are never moved. You are sitting in the same office with people who are not born again who could die after office hours. You are not bothered. Even when you are listening to my teaching, you are hiding in the toilet because you don't want them to know that you are listening. What kind of salvation do you have? You've known the truth and your friends who are in falsehood but you are afraid to talk because you don't want them to persecute you. Who are you living for? That we henceforth not live for ourselves but for him who died for us and gave himself for us. When you notice the chaos of this world that get into you, it's time to pull back and take some time to pray and look at the things God has done all over your life and thank him for the things he has done and come back again fired up to get more people to the knowledge of the truth. Can I have a powerful amen? amen. When a man gets to that place where he allows the cares of this world to bother him, anything makes sense. You read something on social media and say everybody is tired. You say it's true. Everybody is really tired. This life is very tiresome. <laughs> Everything makes sense. Not everybody is tired though. There are some of us that are not tired. If you are tired, we can collect your life and add to our own. Go. We are not tired. We have a reason to be around here. Yeah, we are going to be here for a long time. So if you are tired, borrow us your life. Just give us. Go. We know what to do with it. Uh -uh. The other day we were talking with Mama and Jezimeel. I think it was you and Jesse. Then you asked me a question that if we what if if somebody dies now, right? What will be happening in heaven? <laughs> Jesse, I was standing by. I told Mama, I said, nothing. You know. If you die now, go to heaven, you just be in reserve. There's no action there. This is where action is. The church is here. Jesus is here. Holy Spirit is here. The Father is here. The anointing is here. And the assignment is here. Nothing is there. This is where the action is. And God's focus is here because he wants to get people to the kingdom. So if you want to die, go and rest. We are here. We have work here. Go to reserve and be sitting there. And be warming up. And waiting for us. Because nothing will happen there till we are over with the assignment here. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are here to preach this gospel. We will preach it with all our strength. We will preach it with all our hearts. We are not backing down. We are not backing out. We are pushing forward. If they thought we have preached before, they should get ready for what is coming. I thought somebody will shout, Glory! Don't your neighbor say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I preach the gospel in and out of season. I thought somebody will shout, Glory! Please sit down if you can. This is where the action is. If there was action on the other side, the rich man will not be telling Father Abraham to send somebody to earth. No action. All of them have arrived at retirement. This is where action is. Send somebody to go. He said, hey, there's somebody that has reached here cannot go back. Let him rest. The real action men are there. Men that die are people that give up. Because you can't die till you give up. And he gave up the ghost. And so when you give up, you go. We are not give us up. No, 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 no. We are taking this gospel from the mountain to the valley. We are taking this gospel from the presidency to the village. We are taking this gospel from the riverside across the river. This gospel of Christ shall be preached. Somebody is not shouting amen. We are not tired. We are not giving up. The journey has just started. This boy is just warming up. Somebody shout, I hear you. Sit down, tell your neighbor, I'm going nowhere. This is where the action is. We will do this action together here till the job is finished. Glory to God. 
I say glory to God. I say glory to God. To take heed means to pay attention. Pay attention. Acts chapter 8 verse 6 and 10. Pay attention. You pay attention to the flock. You pay attention to your disciples. Pay attention to the members of your campus. You cannot ignore things happening to your disciples. You must mind what your disciples are reading. You must mind what they are watching. You must mind who their friends are. Listen carefully, every one of you here. You, when you have a disciple, you hover around your disciple and protect your disciple jealously until your disciple stands on his feet to also do the same for others. You can't say I'm raising a disciple. You don't know what your disciple is reading. Your disciple is busy reading all kinds of motivational books. And you call him your disciple. You come for prayer cruise. Your disciple is not there. What kind of discipleship are you doing? Jesus was with 12 disciples. Everywhere he went, they went. When he prayed, they prayed. Even when they slept, he woke them up and made them pray. Because that's the way to raise disciples. He went to crusade. They went with him. When you are raising a disciple, you are involved in their lives. You can't be raising disciples carelessly. You've got to be involved. They may say you are prying into their privacy. A disciple has no privacy. If you have privacy, you can't be a disciple. The reason why I'm a disciple is because I'm involved with your life. With the nitty gritties of your life. If you are making a decision, I must know if you are my disciple. If you are about to do something, I must know. I must know who you listen to. I must know who talks to you. I must Because that's why you are my disciple. Take it to your flock. Take it to yourself. You watch over yourself. And this is for every one of us. Because the reason why we teach you all of this is so that you too can rise up and teach others. The things you have heard of me among many witnesses. The same you commit to faithful men. Who shall in turn commit to others. You pay close attention to the flock. It's not just bringing them to church every Sunday. You've got to get involved with their daily lives. Because the outcome of their life is determined by their day-to-day -day activities. You're going for prayer cruise, you carry your disciples. You pray three hours, you make them pray three hours. When they grow, they too will make their disciples pray three hours. Before you know it, everybody in church is on fire for prayer. Because nobody came in and just hovered around. Everybody has been effectively and diligently discipled, taught and trained. We have a church full of power. Men that are trained and coached Men that are ready to enter anywhere and set the place ablaze for the gospel. That's what we're talking about. Praise God. I'm teaching good? That's the meaning of that word. Prosuko. Pay close attention to the flock. Paul says, don't take heed to fables. In 1 Timothy 1.4. Don't, don't, take, don't take heed to fables. In 1 Timothy 3.8. He says, not giving, not giving to. That is taking heed. Hebrews 2 1. Give them more earnest heed. Hebrews 2 1. Second Peter 1 19. Take heed. So the word prosecco is something you are addicted to. An addiction to keep your focus on something. An addiction to keep watching something. It means your gaze is always there. You stay focused. You are single minded. If your eye is single, your body will be full of light. If your eye is double, your body will be full of darkness. You take heed to yourselves. Watch. Take heed to the flock. Actually, the construction of the Greek of that Acts 20 to take heed is, is take heed to yourself because of the flock. It's not like take heed to yourself, take heed to the flock. The original construction is take heed to yourself because of the flock. When you watch yourself, you're watching the flock. So I said that to say this. Your spiritual growth is no longer for you. Your spiritual growth is no longer for you. Other people's lives are now attached to you. So because other people's lives are attached to you, take it to yourself. Take it to the company you are keeping.
Don't discuss your disciples with anyone. Keep their confidence intact. When your disciples tell you things about their lives, hear it alone and forget you had it. Don't carry their issues. Keep their confidence. Don't abuse privilege. Don't discuss your disciples with your friends. So what must I watch? What am I taking here to number one? I must know that the Holy Ghost has made me an overseer. Every one of you must know that. Whether you're a campus coordinator or you're involved in raising disciples or you're involved in building believers, remember, it's the Holy Ghost that has made you an overseer over one person, over two people, over three people, over ten people, over twenty, over fifty, over hundred, over a thousand. It's the Holy Ghost that has made you an overseer. 